Stories of situations like that, I think, are so important for us to realize. The, the church is much bigger than we, we think, right? We are, we are a global church, okay? We, we are all around the world. There are countries where it is illegal to be a Christian, and yet the church still exists there, doesn't it? So it is important to hear those stories because we need to know of the opportunities before us. And in a large sense, that's actually what I want to talk about today as we, uh, we continue on in our journey in Acts here. Um, but I have a confession here, you know, buying a burrito when I was about 17 years old changed the way that I see myself as a Christian, okay? Who likes burritos? Anybody? Now, can you think of the most amazing burrito you've ever had, okay? At one time, right? Yeah, it was pretty good, right? That was my, my story here. I was, I was on a train. I was going from Fullerton to uh, Rotan, New Mexico, and it, the same line actually still runs. You leave Fullerton at about 7 in the evening, and I remember waking up when they refueled in, in Flagstaff, and then I remember waking up somewhere between Arizona and New Mexico. I wasn't really sure. They don't put the sign saying, hey, you're in New, in New Mexico now. And then around lunchtime, we stopped in Albuquerque, and I think they had to refuel, let some people off, put some new baggages on. They said, you got 10 minutes, <laughs> and you can stretch your legs, but make sure you're back on the train, because I still had another, you know, 50-so miles to go on the train. And right there on the train platform was this, this lady. She had a little cart selling burritos. And I thought, I'm hungry. I'm 17, after all, right? And so uh, I go and I buy a burrito, and it was the best burrito ever in my whole memory. I've had a lot of burritos here, but this one was the absolute best burrito. It made an enormous impression on me because obviously, what, 25 years later, I'm still talking about it. <laughs> and all I was doing was passing through Albuquerque that day. Here's how it changed my life, how it changed how I view my life as a Christian. First of all, this lady, well, she was knowledgeable. She knew how to make a burrito, and make it a really good burrito, okay? She knew it. Second of all, she was able to make it well and quickly. I only had 10 minutes. She knew that there was only 10 minutes to sell as many burritos as, as possible. And then third, though, she was available at the right time. <laughs> if she had been there 20 minutes later, no train. <laughs> she had been there 30 minutes. It would have been a freight train rolling through, and maybe get the, the, the engineer, Right? But she was available at just the right time. And I think the passage that we get to in Acts today illustrates these three ideals into our lives as Christians. It instructs us to further our call as disciples of Jesus. So, by the way, my name's Matt. I'm the associate pastor here. I'm really happy to be back. Uh, we, my family and I, we were on vacation for the past two weeks, actually. Uh, we got back last Monday evening. We went all the way up to Montana a little bit of Alberta, Canada, and then swung back down through Idaho that way. Um, great trip. Thanks for the time off. And I'm just ready to, to dive back into God's Word this morning. And uh, I, I've learned things this week, and I hope you learn things this week too. So if, open up your Bibles with me. We're in Acts chapter 18. And Paul is, uh, with his companions, they've been traveling down the uh, the area that we now know is Greece, like Greece and uh, Macedonia, that would be the, the region that he was in. Um, and then finally, he, he came through Athens, and then he came into a much larger city than Athens even. We think of Athens, of course, that's the famous one in Greece. But actually, Corinth, at least in the first century, was a much larger city uh, than Athens. Uh, and it was all because of trade. See, what happened is it was the connection between the eastern side of the Roman Empire with the western side of the, of the Roman Empire. It was, in fact, it was one of the best ways for trade, for cargo and things like that, to get from, say, Turkey to Italy. That's how they would do it. They wouldn't actually go all the way through the Mediterranean, partly because, well, sailing is a dangerous thing, right? <laughs> so, in fact, not to spoil it, but there's going to be a shipwreck later in Acts as they're trying to sail through the Mediterranean. What they would do is they would come into the uh, eastern port near Corinth. It's a city called Sencrea. They would unload the cargo, and there was about a four-mile-wide isthmus. There they would unload it. They would roll it across on logs to the other side, put it on another ship, take it off to Italy. Pretty cool idea, right? And so uh, um, over the years, this became such a huge port city. Uh, and in fact, this saved them hundreds of miles and an upwind sail. Now, upwind sails, they're hard to do anyways, but 
in the, in the boats of the Roman Empire time, they were even harder to do. So they tried to avoid that as much as possible. And so that's why they did this. That sounds like a lot of hard work, doesn't it? So, well, the Romans, they were, they were pretty smart. They, they thought, hey, what if we could take these, like, it's, all, it's not even four miles, it's about three and a half, and they would we just cut a canal straight across it, right? Kind of like Panama Canal, right? Well, they tried it. Unfortunately for the Romans, it failed. However, if you go to Corinth today, there's a canal that was built in the 1800s. I think I actually have some pictures here. Uh, do we have those, Stephen? Yeah, there we go. That's the, uh, the eastern port in, in what, we, what we would know in the Bible as Sencre. And uh, you can see there's, there's obviously a bunch of land missing in the middle there, right? <laughs> uh, that was what was cut out in the late 1800s. I think, you know, steam shovels, think of like that. And then uh, you, there's one more picture here, a sailboat traveling through the middle of it. Isn't that beautiful? You can go do that today. If you go to Greece, if you go to Travels the Paul trip or something like that, you can travel through the Corinthian Canal. And so that's why Corinth became such an important city in the Roman Empire here. Uh, you know, every year, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people would pass through uh, this whole town. Also, we, uh, last week, we were introduced to, to a couple people, Priscilla and Aquila. They were Jews from Rome. The, one of the emperors had exiled all the Jews out of Rome, and so they had to essentially flee. They were displaced people, refugees. And, of course, I, I really love one of the key phrases last week. It was, it was the Lord's words to Paul. He said, do not be afraid. Go on speaking and do not be silent. That was what he was supposed to do in Corinth. You know, Paul, he, I mean, think about it. He had been beat up. He had been in prison so many times. And here is God telling Paul, hey, don't be afraid to speak. And so he started a church here. He started a church in Corinth. And it became a really important church uh, in the first century, but definitely even into the second century and beyond. So let's pick it up where we left off last week. Uh, we're going to be starting chapter 18, verse 12. This is how Paul's time in Corinth ends. It says, When, when Gallio was proconsul in Achaia, and the Jews made a united attack on Paul. Let me stop right there real fast. This is one of those cool markers in Acts, because we know exactly when Gallio was proconsul in Achaia. Achaia was like the state that we would now call Greece, okay? And we know exactly when. So he is here in Corinth sometime between AD 51 and AD 52, okay? And so he, he was, we know exactly when this was taking place. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. These things are real. This is a real account. I just, I just marvel at that. And it says, and they dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. This is in verse 20. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crown, sorry, the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrate tore his garments off and gave them, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong, you know what? You're like, where is he? You know what happened? We got the fans going and whoosh, I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the same spot on my page, and it's amazing that they're actually still in front of, uh, of the authorities here. <laughs> okay, let's pick that back up here. Let me start at verse 12 again. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the, tri to the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the laws. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have no, a reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be the judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And so we see here, all of a sudden, Paul is not the bad guy in the eyes of the Romans anymore. And even before he had to speak, even before he could speak, Gallio kind of came to his defense and said, hey, this is your issue here. So, and then look what happens in the last verse there, verse 17. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to this. So Paul and company, they've been accused again of, of, before the public officials again on their journey. And again, nothing comes to it, right? We've seen this happen. Remember back in Philippi? They were accused. They got imprisoned. I think they got beat up. 
And then there was the earthquake, and they didn't uh, leave the prison. And then the, uh, the, 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 the authorities, they realized, like, oh, they're Roman citizens. And they said, let them go, let them go, just quietly. And Paul said, no, no, make them come apologize. And so they came and apologized to them. And time after time, they are let go because what they're doing is God's work. And it's being recognized even amongst the authorities. I like this last part here. It ends with this, this little tidbit about Sosthenes. Who is Sosthenes? We actually don't know, except that he was the ruler of the synagogue in Corinth at the time. But there's a thought, because there's another Sosthenes that comes up in Scripture. He's mentioned really uh, briefly at the end of Romans, and basically just say, say hi to Sosthenes for me. Perhaps he's the same guy. Perhaps he became a believer after this. And it's just, I think it may be, it's speculative, I know, but it's just speculative on how transformative the gospel can actually be in these situations. I think that's pretty amazing. Anyways, Paul ends his time in Corinth with this, and he goes on and he preaches for a little bit while. Pick it back up in 18. I want to get through our passage because I want to see how this applies to, to life here. So back in verse 18 here, and I am in the right chapter now. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. So he was leaving Corinth. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila at Sencre, remember that's the eastern port of, of the Corinthian area, he had cut his hair for he, had, he was under a vow. Verse 19, and they came to Ephesus and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When, he asked the, when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. Um, but on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed in Caesarea, that's around Israel, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. Okay, I'm stop right there for real fast. This is the end of what we call Paul's second journey. So I have a map of his second journey too here. And so you can, you can kind of see where he went. He, his main city, his sending church was in Antioch in Syria. That's along the eastern side there where we think of Israel. It's north of Jerusalem there. And he went out. He went through Asia. This is the second journey. Eventually, remember, he, he wasn't allowed to preach by the Spirit in Asia. That's like Turkey. And then he, he had this vision. He said, go over to Macedonia. And so he did. That was Philippi. He went over there. He started churches in four of the cities that were there. Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and maybe Athens. I should say five. And then Corinth, okay? And then he finally he returns on his journey. It's a long journey. So he stopped first in Ephesus. Ephesus, if you go there today, it's not a port town. But back then it was, okay? It was a city in decline because sediment was pouring down from the hills of the river and filled in the entire port. So it's actually not a port city, but it was in the first century. Uh, and so that's what he was doing there. Hey, but look, look at that. Now he's preaching the gospel in Ephesus. That's in Asia where he had been prohibited before. The doors had been opened and seems like people were open to the gospel message as well. Finally, he continues on. He lands in Caesarea, which is little bit north of Jerusalem. He goes up to Jerusalem where he arrives and he checks in with uh, probably the church like James and Peter. And then he goes back to Antioch, which kind of was serving as his home base at this time. What did he do? Well, he likely reported to the church. He was looking for fellowship and camaraderie. Being on the mission field, it's hard sometimes. Also, you know, Paul, well, he needed some, some spiritual care as well. He needed some soul care. Every missionary does. And then he completes his journey here. This is verse 23. After spending some time there in Antioch, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of, of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, this is the beginning of what we call his third missionary journey. He's going back to some of the same places that he had gone on the second journey, even the first journey for that matter. And he went back and he was strengthening the churches. He was reteaching them. He was uh, uh, encouraging them with, with the, the, the word of God. And so as we get into this third journey section of the book now, uh, it begins with him revisiting the churches. And then uh, I actually have a map for the third journey as well, so you can kind of see what's going to happen. He goes some of the same places here. And then he spends a really long time in Ephesus. We're actually going to get there very soon. Uh, but I think that's next week here. In the, we kind of get this, the next part of the passage here. It's kind of an in-the-meantime type of passage. 
Paul isn't in Ephesus yet here, but we're going to pick it up with what's happening in Ephesus. And, and so, you know, we think of Paul. And who thinks of themselves like Paul? I mean, does anybody think like, hey, I'm as good as Paul, right? We think of him almost like superhuman, right? He's not. <laughs> he, he's just a person. But we also get these uh, regular kind of disciples, Priscilla and Aquila. And it kind of picks up the story with them. So let's read on. Verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. Okay, stop there. I said it's Priscilla and Aquila. We'll get to them. We introduce a new character here, Apollos. It says many things about him. First of all, he is a Jew from Alexandria. Okay, that's Egypt. And he, so we're very cosmopolitan here, aren't we? All over the Roman Empire. He comes from Egypt. Second of all, he is what we call a professional speaker in the Roman Empire. The, the, the proper word is called a rhetorician or a rhetor. Uh, it's someone who is a speaker. They speak very well. They're very eloquent, unlike myself. And their purpose is to persuade through logic and reason. So they, they, they have a good th- way of making jokes or lining up a good argument to convince people of what they're speaking about. They would often travel too. Now, in his case, that was his training. So he was a really good speaker, but then he was doing it to spread the gospel. He knew scriptures and the way of Jesus. He knew the Old Testament. That's what scriptures they're talking about here. But then he also knew the way of Jesus. Well, how did he know? You ever thought that? How did he know? Paul didn't go to Alexandria. We didn't hear of Peter or Philip or anybody else going to Alexandria. Well, how did he know? Disciples being disciples, what do they do? They make other disciples. (laughs) The church spread. And it wasn't just Paul. It wasn't just Peter. It wasn't just Philip. It was all the disciples taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. What else did Apollos do? Well, he spoke accurately the things of Jesus. I love that detail. The things about Jesus. What are these things? Well, it's, I would say it's the facts about Jesus. Actually, the, the New English translation translates it that way. The facts about Jesus. And what are those facts? So maybe you were here last summer. Anyone here last summer? Because I actually presented the facts. And they come up in the, in the letter to the Corinthians. So I knew that, I know that the Corinthians knew this. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. It says, Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures, that he was buried, that, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Those are the facts that we're talking about here. Those are the facts about Jesus. Then what Paulus, Apollos could do is he could connect the Old Testament all the way to the facts about Jesus here. This was a formal way, this verse, that Christians shared the good news. In fact, a lot of scholars even think this wording of this was formalized, meaning like you would recite it out loud. You would have your kids memorize it in Sunday school. Within months, within months of the resurrection, okay? That's pretty impressive. This was not Paul's original words, probably. We think it was something the church came together and said, hey, we got to know the facts about Jesus. We got to get this straight. So let's make this a phrase that we all can remember. And that's what it is. But Apollos had one little flaw here that, Paul, that uh, Luke points out. He says, he only knew the baptism of John. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> well, John the Baptist, of course, that's what he's talking about. John the Baptist, remember, he baptized Jesus. He was out of the Jordan River baptizing people. It was uh, a baptism of repentance. Hey, that's a good thing, right? I like that. We should be repentant of our sins. And that's what he was baptizing for. What he is uh, contrasting with this is that he did not have knowledge of the baptism of the Spirit. Now, I want you to think about evangelism in the past century, okay? About how we kind of do it today, whether you think of like a harvest festival, a harvest crusade, right? Uh, that was down in Anaheim last month. Um, or if you're, if you're a little older like me, you might think of Billy Graham style evangelism where you go to the stadium and you have, you know, cool bands come up and mus- musicians and then Billy Graham comes up and he gives, well, he, he gives a, a sermon and he preaches the gospel 
And then what happens? He gives an altar call. And you're like, yes, I want to I give my life to Christ. And I think that's where Apollos was. But he took it a little further. He had given his life to Christ. He had received some discipleship, but he hadn't received complete discipleship yet. He was not completely connected to the church. One thing that we see at these, these events, these, uh, these uh, um, Harvest Crusades, Billy Graham events, is that people do trust in Jesus for their forgiveness of their sins. I, I really do believe it. In fact, I was a counselor once at a Billy Graham crusade. Okay, it, was, it was a really amazing event. Uh, and yet, if they don't get connected to a church, what are they missing? Discipleship. <laughs> There's the next part of the journey. It's not a one-time decision. It's the first step for the rest of your life. That's the idea, right? And this is what the church does. I love it. Billy Graham came into Dallas. This is when I was living in Dallas. And he, he would not come unless the church is organized. If somebody gave their life to Christ at Cowboy Stadium on that night, then they were connected to a church. And they would, the church would call them. They would pursue them. They'd say, hey, come on down Sunday. I want you to get you involved in our men's group, our women's group, our couples group. Because you need to be discipled with this decision you made to trust in Jesus. You know, a person's decision is important, but it's really easy to fall away from that decision. It's very common, in fact. According to uh, the Billy Graham uh, Evangelism Association, 3.2 million people gave their life to Christ at Billy Graham events. Okay, that's a lot, isn't it? Where are these people today? You know what? We actually, I mean, I don't know about us, but we do see these people in our churches. We really do. You meet them from time to time. And yet you probably will also meet a lot of people who, who have fallen away. This is where the church comes in. This is where we come in. When somebody trusts in Christ for the forgiveness of, of their sins, they become a disciple. We've been going through this phrase, believe, belong, become, right? And that's what it's talking about, I think, with Apollo, Apollos here. He believed. He started belonging as a disciple as, he accept, as, as you, you're, that acceptance into the life of the church. And then the becoming part comes with the transformation. This is why this was so, uh, an important piece of the, the story here because he didn't know about the baptism of the Spirit, that the Spirit comes in and dwells us as believers at that moment of decision when we place our trust in Christ. It's that baptism of the Spirit that's the transformative part. That's the power of God that we see in our lives. It's where our testimony comes in. When, we, when someone gets up here and they talk about, well, they talk, it's really a three-part outline. Before Christ, how they met Christ, how their lives were transformed by Christ. That's a testimony right there. So there's, you don't have to get any more fancy than that. That is what we're talking about. It's the transformation that takes place through the baptism of the Spirit. There's a proper order to the, the dynamics in conversion here. First things first, right? And Apollos got it right. The facts about the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15. And then, uh, and by the way, Priscilla and Aquila, they had learned this as well. Uh, Apollos had learned this in Alexandria. And then, second things, of course, go second. <laughs> Submit to the Spirit and His work to regenerate you. It's the, this new breath of life that comes into us. And that's what Apollos had experienced, but he didn't know what it was. And so he, when he was preaching the gospel, he didn't know about the Holy Spirit. He didn't know about the regenerative work of the Spirit. Let's move on here. Verse 26. He, Apollos, began to speak boldly in the synagogue... But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Okay, this is where Priscilla and Aquila come in. I love it because it's the church at work doing what the church is supposed to do. I love it. They take him aside and they instruct him more accurately. Apollos already knew it accurately. It said that, right? He instructed them more accurately. It doesn't actually say what they instructed him on. I think it had to do with, with uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's just my guess, though. So don't quote me on that one, please. Um, but I love how they did this, though. They, they had a winsome interaction. Okay, what, what does winsome mean? Well, it means 
it's an attractive way of presenting something, all right? You know, it, it's not a fire and brimstone type of, you're the worst person in the world type of thing, and you, you better do what I say you better do, right? It's winsome. It, it, there's a, an air of gentleness to it, okay? Think of this. Think of the fruit of the Spirit. What does the fruit of the Spirit talk about? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, those types of things. If we are controlled in that manner, then when we teach somebody the gospel, we do it winsomely. We do it in a way that is actually attractive. And I think Priscilla and Aquila uh, did this. They built a relationship with him. They took him off on the side. They didn't like stand up in the middle of the sermon and go, heretic. <laughs> so, right? <laughs> they, they didn't do that. Sorry, I forgot a little loud there. But yeah, they, they, they did it in a way that he was actually going to be able to hear them. Okay? We do this a lot. We speak in ways, we speak across, we speak over each other, we speak at each other, and not to one another. And you know what? When we're speaking to one another or at one another, we don't hear each other. Okay? That's what Twitter is, is all about. I mean, Twitter, no one listens on Twitter. You post your little tweet. It's 120 characters, and then you just let it go. And there's, you know, for famous people, what, the comments fill up, right? With, oh, well, actually, well, you're wrong, bigot. You know, I mean, all kinds of things. That's Twitter for you right there, okay? So stay off it. <laughs> That's my advice. But we want to build relationships. We want to present truth. I, I love, uh, so the, the president of Biola University, he talks about this. He says, we need to have a firm center, a firm center, and yet soft edges, okay? What does that mean? Well, it means that we have to have the convictional truth that delivered with the appeal and, 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 uh, and the results are of our transformation in Christ. So we have those convictions and we want it. We, we don't want to. We need to bring them up. We need to have those. But we need to be also, well, filled with the fruit of the Spirit. The gentleness, the kindness, the patience. Well, anyways, let's read the last verse here. Verse 27 and 28. Again, back to Apollos. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, that's where Corinth is, the brothers encouraged him and wrote, uh, and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. One of those people that I think about, one of those Jews in Corinth, well, Sosthenes. I just mentioned, it's probable that he shows up later as, as a key disciple when Paul is writing the, the letter to Romans. Yeah. And so, could it be that Apollos, with his winsomeness, with his soft edge, making the gospel appealing, but yet his firm core, led Sosthenes to the Lord? That's a possibility. Scripture is a mirror. When we read Scripture, we need to see ourselves. And from this passage, I want to work together towards three things that we need to see ourselves in. The first thing that we need to do as believers, as disciples, we need to be people who know and understand Scripture. Paul spent about 10 years studying and mastering the word before his first missionary journey. Okay. Ten years. That's a long time. Uh, and I think even before that, he was helping the church in Antioch. He was teaching in the church in Antioch uh, because he had studied so well. But again, that's Paul. He really is human, by the way. <laughs> he really is. You see, in, in, especially in his, in his uh, letters like to, you know, to Timothy and Titus, you see a little bit more of the human side of him. Uh, even in, even in the, the letters to the Corinthians, you see his human side where he's tired, where he's worn out sometimes, where he, he strives for something that is just, feels like to him it might be beyond his reach. But we see Priscilla and Aquila, and we see the saints in Corinth. They learned together for one and a half years under Paul, a skilled teacher, right? They learned scripture and they knew scripture. 
Priscilla and Aquila were then able to present the gospel more accurately to Apollos. They could do that. It took him one and a half years. Apollos, I don't know how long it took him. <laughs> you know, so, so, he was somebody who knew scripture and he could defend the faith really, really well. Can you defend the faith? Last summer, I remember I, we had five facts about the resurrection. That's a great place to start. So, I would consider it one of the pillars holding up our faith. On one side, we have the facts of the resurrection. On the other side, I think we have uh, the, uh, the, the authority of Scripture. And, and part of that, I think we have the reliability of Scripture. Okay? You, can, you can do a ton of research on how accurate this book is in terms of it not contradicting itself, in terms of it presenting what really happened and what was really uh, desired to be, to be meant. I think of Psalm 19. I, I don't have this on the screen, but it says this. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words, the Bible. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Is that what scripture is to us? Is that what we think of when we read this, this book? If it is, awesome. Digest the word. It's calorie free too. You don't have to have self-control in reading the scripture. <laughs> Yet it's sweeter than honey. So be that person who knows scripture. Number two, be the person who engages others in Christ winsomely. I love this word, winsomely. Priscilla and Aquila showed winsomeness when they approached Apollos. Also, note that they didn't uh, let the issue slide either. We have to encourage each other. We have to, to, to correct each other when we're wrong. We are human. We don't have all the right things in place. Even in Scripture. It, I mean, most people have read something of Scripture in here, I believe. I mean, if you did just right now, you have a little bit, right? And I, I know more and more people in our church are getting through the entire Bible. But that's once. Did you remember it all? <laughs> Probably not. You got to do it over and over and over. This is my second time actually preaching on this passage. And uh, um, I actually get, this was one of those, the first times I think ever that I've got to go back into my notes from years ago and, and see like, hey, how did I teach that before? And uh, you know what? Even as I was studying this week, I'm like, wow, I didn't see that before. Oh, I learned this new. And I'm excited about it. I do that to every single passage that I come to. You got to have that firm core with the soft edges. When I present the scripture up here, I don't want to ram it down your throats. That's not my job. My job is to do this in a way that's appealing. Because you know why? Well, I'm up here talking. I really want you to hear me. <laughs> if I'm up here yelling, if I'm up here being angry and fed up, well, you're, you're going to kind of tune out, aren't you? So. And so uh, I want to do it in a winsome way. And so I want to present it so that you can actually hear the gospel. On our trip uh, to, to uh, Wyoming, we listened to a book. That's a, we listened to a lot of books, actually. But we listened to Through Gates of Splendor by Elizabeth Elliot. The story of, of her husband, Jim, and some other missionaries who were in Ecuador in the 1950s. And they were doing, well, first level mission work is getting in touch, in contact with tribal people who literally had no clue who, who Jesus Christ was. They had never heard the name of Christ before. They didn't even know the language. And so the, the way they were going about it was, it was pretty remarkable. Uh, there was one tribe and even the Ecuadorian government, even the other tribes of Ecuador said, stay away. When you get up next to them, they will kill you. And 
it was really true. There was time after time where these, these, this tribe uh, had killed people who, who they ran into and just in contact. And so especially as Christian missionaries, they were like, wow, we need to be careful with this. But they knew, they knew the stakes. They knew that if, if they don't get the gospel to them, they're going to die without Jesus. So they worked super hard. They developed new techniques. They developed new ideas. There was one guy who was a pilot because there's no roads back there. And he developed a new way of flying that would hang a bucket where people could do it while the plane is doing a circle. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty amazing. Nobody had ever thought of that before. And, and, and yet he figured it out so that he could reach them with the gospel. They gave him gifts, things like machetes. Okay? A great gift, right? <laughs> I know that's what my kids want for Christmas. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to them, though, that was the world because they didn't have steel. And they knew that they had a faith that was worth sharing. But they knew that they had to earn the hearing of it. They worked hard for it. Are we working hard to earn, that, to earn people's ears? Do people want to listen to us? Do we have the character, the gentleness, the kindness that people are going to listen? If we have a faith worth sharing, well, why? Why is it worth sharing, right? Well, one, first things first, because it's true. Always, always start there. It's that firm center, right? We got to have the convictions right. We got to know scripture right. The other reason that it's worth sharing, though, is because it's transformative. I think this is what Apollo had learned, that when you make that decision of faith, Spirit enters into you, begins that work to transform it. Of course, yes, we have to submit to the Spirit. But this is the point where addictions can be overcome. This is the point where abuse cycles can end and transformation can be found. This is where couples who are mutually submitting to the Spirit, couples who are having a horrible time in marriage, it's where their marriage can go from endless strife to abundant, life-giving, joyful relationship. It doesn't happen on our own accord here, people. It happens because the Spirit transforms us from within. So first, yes, no Scripture. Second, be a person who engages others in Christ winsomely. Third, be the person who is available for the sake of the gospel. Priscilla and Aquila, they were there. They were available. They went from Corinth to Ephesus. Short-term mission trip, right? <laughs> yeah. They were doing what disciples do. What is that? Disciples make? Disciples, that's right. That was their availability. They were tent makers, by the way. Tents were made out of leather, so they were stitching leather together. That's, I think that's kind of hard, but I don't know. Um, they actually hired Paul while he was in Corinth, too. Apollo, though, he was available. He started traveling the Roman Empire and preaching the gospel. We might, might call this, by today's standards, vocational ministry. And you know what? We do need people to go into vocational ministry. We do need pastors. We need pastors desperately. So I see every single week empty pulpits that aren't filled because no one's answered the call. So be available as a disciple who makes disciples no matter where you are. You don't have to go just to South Dakota, although you can. You don't have to go to Corinth, although you can. You can go to Crestline. You can go to Lake Arrowhead. You can go to VOE. We can be disciple makers here. I want us to understand, though, the urgency that is here. Do we understand the difference, though, between going to church and being the church? We often ask the question, do you go to church? And it's, a, it's a normal question, right? We want, we want to know something about the person. Do you go to church? We might invite them to church. Why do we do this? Well, sometimes in our culture, I think we think going to church, we go to church in order to receive the religious goods and services. We, what, is that, what, what does that look like? We, we're expecting. We're expecting to feel better about ourselves, I think, is really what it's at. We're preaching to ourselves what, what some people have called the gospel of sin management. And so if I go to church, 
And for that next week, you know what? I can feel like a good person. And uh, I can feel like I, I did the right thing here. Uh, but, and many, if not most of us, actually start there, right? But don't forget. Don't forget what Priscilla and Aquila taught Apollos. The facts about Jesus and the call to discipleship, the, tr- the call to inner transformation through the Spirit. However, being the church, remember, the church is not a building. The church has no religious goods and services, We don't offer anything, okay? The church is the disciples who depend on Jesus. The disciples who submit to the Spirit and are transformed because of it. And they help everyone around them know Jesus. And we have a faith that is worth sharing because it is true. And it is powerful, right? Yes. There's an urgency to this for us to be disciples who make other disciples, If you had lived in Corinth in 51 AD, and you had put your trust in Jesus, would you have been ready? Would you have been ready like Priscilla and Aquila to instruct an Apollos? Would you have been ready to make other disciples in Ephesus in just one and a half years? How long have you been here? How long have you been sitting in our midst here? Maybe your timeline is shorter. Maybe it was six months. Maybe it was one month. I've known people who come to the Lord and then they are ready to preach to others within days. They, they do it. They talk about how much Christ has transformed them. Maybe it's longer. Maybe it's a few years. Maybe it's 10 years. If you're a kid, I know some, some teenagers are here, it probably will be longer because sometimes that growth coincides with your actual growing up. So it takes longer. But are you moving forward? That's really the question today. In response, you know, Scripture is a mirror. And then we need to see ourselves in it and then respond out of how we see ourselves in it. You know, some of us are called to stay here. And and you say, hey, well, I'm not called to be a pastor. I'm not saying to be a pastor. I'm saying be a disciple. But I, there's things I do as a pastor that are not part of my, I'm not going to say job description, as a disciple of Jesus. I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus no matter what my vocation is. Okay? I'm a music teacher as well. You know what I, I'm, I am as a music teacher? I'm a disciple. Okay? I'm still making disciples even in a secular situation. So I, I have a, a call for us today. I want you to consider that here. But I want my call to go further. I want, this to, to, I want you to think about the opportunities that exist globally. And Eddie, perfect tag on here, because Eddie said, hey, you can get involved with China Aid. You can know those opportunities. And that's something you can actually do here, just by writing a letter in English to somebody who may not even understand English. And yet, how powerful is that, that we can encourage a brother or sister in Christ? I know uh, Julie, our children's director, she's taking steps too. Next winter, she's planning to start a systematic two-year gospel-centered program for women in ministry leadership uh, in January. It's through our denomination, uh, the FCA. And I actually met a couple of the professors last, uh, last month, and I am impressed. This is a phenomenal program. I, I, I think there's nothing better out there um, at this level, okay? Um, phenomenal. She's preparing to do more with ministry to lead others to Christ. But also, some of us are called to go out and serve. We had our Lakota team last month go uh, to South Dakota. Was, that's a great first step. And you know what? You can actually sign up now for next year's trip, okay? Take the steps now. But you know what? The world's a big place, And there are opportunities all across the globe for disciple-making. And it's urgent, too. People are dying without Christ because they have not heard the gospel. They have not heard in a way that they can actually hear it. We have not earned their ears yet. So I have a challenge for you. I have an incentive for you as well. So... um, Later today, I'm going to send out an email to our email list. Make sure you're on our email list. It has two things. First of all, a video link. 
I want you to watch the video. It talks about missions. It talks about what people are doing across the, the face of this earth to, to, to make disciples. The second thing that I want you to do, there's a website, go in there, and I want you to look at the current opportunities that we have in missions. And you're thinking, well, I'm not a missionary. I'm a computer programmer. You know what? They have opportunities for computer programmers. So, did anybody like sports? You coach baseball, right? North Africa, there's an opportunity for sports ministry. Ah, yes, yes. And you're going to be making disciples as you go. So here's what I want. I'm going to send the email out. I want you to watch the video. I want you to, to browse this list of opportunities. Now, the first five people to send me an email, you can do that through the, through the email as well, it, with the names of the people in the videos and one opportunity that you could actually do are going to be invited to my house next Sunday for a barbecue. Okay? I, 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 I don't want to brag, but I'm a good cook. Okay? Um, I, I make good food. And uh, I'm going to go all out. So, and uh, lots of meat. And uh, if, you're, uh, if, if you spawn in one of the five and you're a vegan or a vegetarian, I will make vegetarian stuff too. <laughs> Smoke some tofu. So, <laughs> or something like that. I don't Yeah. I guess that's still vegan. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I want you to do this because if we don't know the opportunities before us, we can never become disciple makers. We will never see the, the, the opportunities even right before us here. There's opportunities on there for teachers. Okay. I, last month, this was at the, our, our denominations convention and we, we saw missionaries. We've known them like 20 years probably. And um, they're in Portugal. And I, I didn't even know they were going to be there. That's why part of the reason we went, because we see these old friends and we're like, hey, how you doing? And it was just so good to see them, but they were like, one of the biggest things we need is we need teachers. And uh, they, they know my parents as well. My parents are retired teachers. And they said, can you talk to your parents? They need to come to Portugal. <laughs> and I'm like, mom, dad, why aren't you going? You can do this. The opportunity is right there before them. We never, we will never be disciple makers. We don't see the opportunities God has placed before us. But take this challenge here. You're going to get that email this afternoon. We're going to lead into our, our time of, of the Lord's Supper here. We're talking about the urgency of the gospel. The urgency to get out there and make disciples. And this meal the cup and the bread. They are the reminder why we do this. They're the reminder of why people need Jesus. Because Jesus died for them. Hey, you know what? That's the facts about Jesus. Jesus died for our sins in accordance with Scripture. He was buried. He was resurrected three days later. Yes, amen. Those are the facts about Jesus. But this supper, the Lord's Supper, does one more thing here. It reminds us of the facts, but it calls us forward to our transformation. We rely on the Spirit to work in us, to transform us in our lives so that we can know Scripture. We can be controlled by the gentleness, kindness, humility, self-control. We will be winsome as believers and attractive as a church. So I want you to take a moment here. Do this on your own. Gather the elements and then reflect on, on what, what we talked about here. The facts about Jesus. And then how Jesus has transformed you in your life. Take some time right now and then uh, continue worshiping with us this morning. Let me pray. Father, oh, Father, thank you. Thank you for people like Apollos, people like Aquila and Priscilla. Examples for us, people in Scripture who had that firm center, they knew with conviction the 
facts about Jesus. They stood on those facts, the resurrection and on scripture. And yet, they relied on your spirit in their transformation. They were transformed by your spirit to new people, new creations. And they knew their call as disciples to go out and make other disciples. Lord, today, today, Lord, drive that into our hearts. May you set the fire for us that we will have the passion and we will see the opportunities and we will walk forward in those opportunities. We will not sit one more day, but we will move forward, become disciples who make disciples for your glory, for your kingdom. May we be forgotten. May we earn the ears of people, but in the end, may we be forgotten so that you may be known. Guide us into this time through the rest of this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.